So, for our last talk of this, this seminar, uh, workshop, sorry, a talk by Margarida, Amen, um, me and numbers and name, and Amen, for a talk on, uh, entitled Ontic Causation in Biophysics. Sorry again for that. Absolutely fine. Um, thank you. So, um, I'm presenting. Uh, some joint work with James Lederman, and I'd just like to say that this is very much work in progress, so um, suggestions, criticism, uh, very welcome. Um, so here's a brief outline of my presentation. Um, I'm going to discuss ontic causation um, in the context of several um, scales Within um, within the functioning of a biological system, so my example is going to be the flight of a bird, and we're going to look at it through different uh, scales and see what we conclude from that. So, um, biological systems involve physical, chemical, and biological entities and processes at various scales. I think that's uh, uncontroversial. Uh, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> and the causal effects produced by these entities are due to their specific properties and the interactions into which they enter. So we take ontic causation <coughs> to include physical causation, broadly construed as involving physical, chemical and or biological entities at various scales. So ontic causation in biology occurs when there is uh, such physical causation within biological entities that contributes to biological function. So we think that um, human regularity and interventionist accounts of causation have a um, kind of flat structure where the relata of causation are events, um, but I'm open to being corrected on that. And in contrast, in biology, entities at different scales are relevant to the understanding of causation. And it's not that you can't say more or less exactly the same thing on an interventionist account of causation, but thinking of it in terms of ontic causation makes the, important of the importance of scale more perspicuous. So there's ontic causation at different scales, but there is also mixing of scales and there are no global levels. And we also argue that the separation of the time scales of the dynamics of different kinds of processes within living systems is critical to biological function. So why is it interesting to uh, think about biophysics in this context? So biophysics studies the physical properties of biological systems and their environments and how they interact with biological properties in the context of biological processes and activities. So I disagree that physics do, doesn't have anything to um, say about biology. <laughs> um, and this is because biological entities are not only composed of physical entities, but they are also themselves physical objects, subject to universal laws of physical science at various scales, which is something that has also been highlighted uh, earlier today. And looking at causation from a biophysical perspective can help us identify ontic causation in biological systems that spans multiple scales. So, um, so like I said, I'm going to discuss a couple of examples of ontic causation at different scales in the context of uh, the example of um, the flight of a bird. So starting with cellular respiration. So, um, here's a brief description of what happens in cellular respiration. So, um, in the mitochondria, electrons are stripped from food and they're passed along a chain of carriers all the way to oxygen, which acts as an electron acceptor. And the energy released in these electron transfer events is used to pump protons across the membrane. So, the outcome is a proton gradient over the membrane and then the membrane act, acts like a hydroelectric dam. So just as water flowing from a reservoir 
drives a turbine to generate electricity. Uh, in cells, in the mitochondria more specifically, the flow of protons through protein turbines, which actually physically rotate, drives the synthesis of ATP, which is uh, the energy currency of the cell. So cellular respiration takes place in mitochondria, and the inner mitochondrial membrane causes the proton gradient that generates the proton motive force, which is used to produce ATP. And the proton gradient requires both the physical structure of the membrane, including, in particular, its impermeability to protons. If that is, if that is not there, then there's no gradient. As well as the proton pumps, which are the um, proteins that are embedded in the membrane, which uh, actively transport the protons. So it's only the membrane as a whole that can be identified as the entity responsible for causing the proton gradient. The causal processes at this scale depend on the higher scale entity function as an unchanging environment that determines the causal background. Still within cellular respiration, let's also look at mitochondrial DNA. So in the mitochondria, so mitochondria, um, as everyone knows, uh, descend from um, independent uh, bacteria. and have now become uh, organelles in eukaryotic cells. And, but they still have their own DNA, right? So mitochondrial DNA molecules, just like any other kind of DNA, are transcribed into RNA and translated into proteins. But as you also probably know, most mitochondrial genes have actually been transferred to the nucleus over the course of evolution. And there are a number of reasons for that. Um, so, um, for instance, uh, it is thought that um, transferring genes to the nucleus uh, protects DNA from um, oxidative damage um, due to oxygen free radicals and so on. Um, it can also have something to do with uh, maintaining male fitness because mitochondria are just uh, maternally inherited. So there's very good reasons for these genes to have been transferred to the nucleus. But not all the genes have been transferred, and some are still in the mitochondria. So why is that? The genes that have not been transferred to the nucleus are critical genes that are needed to control respiration locally. So mitochondria need to very quickly respond to changes in electron flux, <coughs> oxygen availability, uh, the ratio of ATP to ADP, and so on. All of these things need to be which are critical for respiration, um, they need to respond very quickly to these. So the DNA molecules that code for these genes need to be physically located as close as possible to the mitochondrial membrane where respiration is taking place. So it's not just the information content of the genes that matters to cellular function, but also the location of the DNA molecules and the time scale in which they can be used to produce the proteins needed for respiration. So we think that this is a kind of anti-causation in the sense that it is the token molecules themselves located right next to the membrane that cause the adjustment of the levels of certain proteins to maintain cellular respiration working properly. Next, let's um, look at the um, macroscopic scale. So, in self-powered flight, there are a lot of things happening. At the cellular scale, um, and this is very um, um, summarized, um, you have efferent neurons firing, they send an action potential down the axon, and they cause muscle fibers to contract. And it's the aggregative effect of the coordinated contraction of large numbers of individual muscle fibers wrapped together in bundles that produces the movement of the wing. So the coordination of the muscle fibers, each of which is contracting on its own, brings about the flapping of the wing, which in birds generates lift and thrust. So self-powered flight, I think, can only be understood as a phenomenon that involves the whole organism, 
Because the capacity for self-powered flight involves properties of the organism as a whole, such as its size, its mass, its aerodynamic shape, which is complemented by behavioral post postural adjustments, physical structures that are capable of generating lift and thrust, which in birds is, are the same, it's the wings, uh, but in other kinds of flying organisms could be different structures. Uh, an example of that is flying squid, which have a kind of jet propulsion, uh, which is not the same thing that generates uh, lift. Um, sensory systems that provide the central nervous system with data to assess position, speed, distance, and so on, and a central nervous system that is able to process all that information and adjust muscle movements in, respond to sudden, in response to sudden changes in pitch, yaw, air currents, and so on. So again, this is a case of anti-causation, and in this case, it's the organism as a whole entity that causes its own movement through the air in self-powered flight. So what do I think we can learn from this? So causation in a complex system such as a living organism involves the effective separation of the spatial, temporal and energy scales of different processes and entities. So just to compare, at the molecular scale, we have the electric potential of the proton gradient across the mitochondrial membrane is of the order of 150 to 200 millivolts over a distance of 5 nanometers. And ATP production takes place at a rate of 10 million ATP molecules per second within each cell. And then each ATP molecule releases um, around 8 times 10 to the minus 20 joule of energy when converting to ADP, which is also happening at an extremely fast rate. And, and contrast that with a macroscopic scale, where a small flying bird will typically flap its wings at an average frequency of 10 hertz, which means 10 flaps per second and has a kinetic energy of about 2 joule. But the different scales are not global, so we're not talking about levels of reality. There is no global separation of physical, chemical and biological scales. What there is is that the scales are determined by the dynamics of the relevant systems. So there is local separation of scales, with different kinds of processes taking place at different scales involving both physical and biological entities. However, the scales are always mixed to some extent, so the local separation of scales is not absolute. So we're denying the existence of these separate ontological levels. And the functioning of the entire organism emerges from the dynamics of these different processes. That's it. Thank you. Um, could I, could I just, just before the questions, would it be okay if I take this opportunity to advertise something? Please do. You have the time. Thank you. You could have done it during your talk. So we, we're going to have a workshop on the philosophy of biophysics in Bristol, mm. uh, 14 to 15 September. Uh, and even though the deadline for submissions was actually yesterday, we are still very happy to. <laughs> you should have said it before. <laughs> should. We are still very happy to accept submissions until, let's say, the end of this month. Uh, so here are some topics that we would be happy to receive submissions about. And just please email a 500-word abstract to me on that email. Thank you. Cool. Let it there for people yeah. to take yeah. notes. Plenty of time for questions. Yes. Yes. Thank you very much. This is very, very exciting work. Um, I wonder uh, when you said that the membrane, only the membrane, is a cause of uh, the proton uh, gradient. And for example, the. Uh, uh, 
uh, respiratory enzymes that pump protons are not. I mean, what, what sense of cause are you um, presupposing? Uh, it, it seems to me that, of course, um, the uh, proton pumps, for example, are only partial causes. So they are they are difference-making causes. I mean, um, so they make it they make a difference with respect to the phenomenon. So turning off the proton pumps sure. will lead to a, to an equilibration of the of the. For example, when you poison the cytochrome oxidase with with cyanide, then the the, the, the proton gradient will equilibrate. So in, in that sense, it is a cause. It's it's a difference maker. Um, Yes. You agree? Okay. I agree. Yeah. So, so I was thinking of the membrane as including the proton pumps. Uh, I think I so might have said that. Okay. So the proton gradient requires both the physical structure of the membrane, specifically the impermeability to right. protons, right. as well as the proton pumps. So I'm not saying that they are not a cause, oh, okay. but because they were embedded in the membrane and they're fundamentally part of how the membrane operates, um, I'm not seeing them as a distinct cause as opposed to the membrane. So it's the membrane which includes not just the um, bilayer and, um, and, and which is in, impermeable to protons, but it's also the membrane as including the proton. Right, right. But I agree that if they're not functioning, then yeah, it's going to be. Can I follow up? Yeah, briefly. Uh, I, I can't really say what it is, but something in me resists to viewing the membrane as a cause of the of the potential. Maybe it's the fact that it, there's nothing changing really. The membrane is just a structural constraint, as it were, and it's nothing is happening with the membrane. Well, nothing that's really relevant to the to the gradient. In that sense, I have a tendency of saying that's sort of a constraint of the of, 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 of the system. I mean, usually by causes, uh, causation in you know in, in, in the by now well-known Woodwardian interventionist sense is change-related. But the, the membrane, it seems, is is static. It's it's kind of a static structure here uh, with respect to the res respiratory mechanism. So I'm I'm not sure. Somehow I I find this strange to call it a cause. Okay, uh, so I don't think that it's exactly, so I think you're partly right, uh, but I don't think it's exactly right to say that the membrane is static and it's not doing anything. Um, so the membrane with its proton, with its proton pumps is actively uh, keeping the, um, the proton gradient, okay. but yeah. it is... All right. You're right in the sense that there is this uh, background and changing oh, the, the thing that including is the proton exactly pump. I see. yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Because the proton pumps are the part of the membrane that are actively pumping the protons. Right. Right. But that alone would also cause absolutely nothing unless the membrane as a, a, um, an unchanging causal background of impermeability. So the, the grad gradient would collapse immediately. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I, I have to think about it. Okay. So. Thanks. Caleb? Yeah, thank you so much. This is really interesting. So I'm curious about, um, uh, you do say uh, early on in the talk that you, that you think interventionism has a sort of flat structure and that ontic causation is a superior alternative? Is that is that sort of way of pitching it? It's you not. Can, you can say yes. I hope you do. <laughs> <laughs> if it's what you believe. <laughs> I'm not saying it's superior. Um, I think it's more helpful to think in terms of ontic causation because um, it makes. Um, it highlights the importance of the entities that are causing things as opposed to just events and things happening. And it makes, and it also highlights the importance of the different scales. That's why I think it's a better way of thinking about it. So I wonder what you would, so, yes. And then I wonder what you would say to the, to a response like this. Well, actually, you can't, I mean, 
onto causation is just had a different scope of explanation, but it's parasitic on something like interventionism, right? So you've got to eventually say something like, um, like the membrane, like the membrane is a difference maker, right? And so there's still there's still a, an account of causation buried in there, but what you've done is just sort of zoomed out, and you've now applied it to a sort of multi-scale biophysical domain. Um, so I wonder if if uh, I wonder if yeah, what would you say to that? <coughs> Daniel doesn't like well, it. entities <laughs> entities that that cause things. Uh, Obvi are obviously difference makers in, in the sense that um, they're doing something and if they weren't there they would not be that other thing would not happen so in that sense yes but I don't really see how the how the account is parasitic on the um, on the interventionist account of causation could you say more about that well because it, it because on did you argue that are you exactly the reverse during your talk that in fact <laughs> I did, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, she was she was expecting she knew this coming. Um, no, so, uh, good. So, you've got to have... So, ontic causation itself, it doesn't provide an account of causation, right? It is a sort of scope of explanation that uses an account of causation. And it seems like the account of causation that you're using is interventionism. You could, you could convince me otherwise. But that's why I say it's parasitic on it, because embedded in your scope of explanation is an account of causation. It's not David Lewis's account. No, it's, it's not true. probabilistic causation. It's not, it may be his mechanism. But there's also difference-making interventionism in there. So I'm wondering, if, yeah, please. OK, so if I have to pick one of those, I'd say it's the mechanistic one. Mm -hmm. um, I think the interventionist account is a very interesting way of us figuring out what causes what rather than itself being a good account of causation but I'll um, have to think more about it yeah and yeah I think, I think we have a lot to talk about <laughs> okay. um, it, I kind of want to provoke Charles into saying something, <laughs> because okay. we've talked about this before. But to me, one of the, one of the great advantages of talking about biophysical, like, talking about organisms in biophysical terms, for me, gives, you, gives one the op an opportunity that is not granted by talking about organisms in strictly biochemical terms, which is that Biophysics traditionally has been much more instrumentalist and much more agnostic about um, about units of material, right? Like a bio Sorry, much more agnostic about material. about units of material. Yeah, okay. like you can do biophysics without assuming the molecular hypothesis, right? You just you can just say, I'm going to ignore whether molecules exist and still go do good biophysics. Um, because physics has this strongly positivistic history to it, where physicists at some point said, it doesn't matter what the thing is that we're measuring. As long as we measure it, then the measurements are real and we do something. Right, Charles, we've had these discussions yeah. before. Yes, it's been a long time, you're right, yeah. Right? You, you read my uh, only paper in biophysics with <laughs> exactly that. Okay, I Let's measure ion channels. I don't care how it works, the pump, the thing, it turns. It turns. You said it's looking like a turbine. Oh my yeah. god. Yeah. I don't know. It's small. I don't know. It's a turbine. Yeah, it's so it's true that biophysical, biophysical means the techniques often are quite the, the, the details the, of the mechanical yeah, things. That biophysics is phys is philosophically interesting to, to me. That was at that caveat to me because of this pervasive agnosticism to what is there. But not all the time. Not all the time. Okay. Uh, and yes, 
Can I respond to that and then you can go yeah. on? Okay. Um, so it is true that you can do that, but you don't have to. You don't have to. You don't have to. And biophysics is physics, but it's also biology. And biology is quite committed to the existence of these entities. And I personally am quite committed to uh, like a really strong scientific realism. So that to me is not the appeal of biophysics. Mm -hmm. Although absolutely you can do that. But, yeah, go on. Uh, yeah, just a, a, a follow yeah, up to, to, yeah. to this conversation here. Um, I mean, historically, it was, it's indeed interesting to know that um, the uh, scientist who proposed this mechanism for the first time, Peter Mitchell, mm -hmm. he was very much a biophysicist and he didn't care much about molecules. And he, he, uh, uh, um, his first um, publications about this mechanism were full of uh, physical computations, so thermodynamical calculations about the feasibility of this, of this mechanism. And he did, didn't care about uh, molecules at all. I, I don't even think, think he believed in the existence of proton pumps. This was controversial for a long time. And only once these, these proton pumps have been characterized uh, was the, uh, meta me me the mechanism um, with proton gradients, etc., et described in these terms as you presented them. However, that was completely figured out by biochemists. And I, I happen to know one of the biochemists who was involved in, in, in this, uh, describing these molecules. Uh, he once was my uh, bio biochemistry professor. And he used to say that, um, well, we just identify the molecules and then, uh, that, that then our job is done. Then we hand it over to the biophysicists. And that's, I, think, I think that's, that's pretty accurate historically. How, so first, first was the biophysical hypothesis, then the biochemists identified the molecules, and then they handed it back, and now the biophysicists are describing the workings of these, the, these molecular motors. Um, that's, that's kind of it. I agree with all of that. I think it but fits nicely with what yeah. Daniel just said. Yeah. But initially the biochemists were kind of reluctant to accept the chemiosmotic yes. hypothesis. Yes, indeed, yeah. Because they thought it's all chemical, there's no... No, me no membrane involved, going no, 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 two, no two phases, exactly. all, all in a homogeneous medium. But yeah. once they accepted that, then yeah. yeah. And, and that is the model of the molecule. <laughs> the, the pump, yeah, yeah. The, the ATP is. So this is, I think I mentioned Carl Matlin's book to you. Which one? To Carl Matlin's book, Crossing the Boundaries of Life. Yes, you did. Yeah. yeah. So there's um, there's a chapter up in that book on, on Mitchell and King Rosemont hypothesis. And one of the cool things he mentions is that, well, Mitchell had the electron micrograms of, of mitochondria. And managed to derive a more correct theory of the structure of mitochondria based on the microelectron micrograms, but also in conjunction with the chemiosmotic hypothesis. Right? So it's, it's an interesting case of this physicalist thinking and instrumental results okay. moving together. Good, I didn't know that. Yeah. Sure. One thing I really like here, I like a lot of stuff here, this is really cool, but one thing I really like here is it raises a really interesting question that it's one of those questions that I'm kind of surprised that I never slowed down and thought about, which is sort of when exactly does spatial organization matter, right? When because, does spatial organization yeah, matter? Yeah, because we have, you know, sometimes it, sometimes it doesn't, right? Sometimes we write down a Craver diagram and we don't care where the crap in the Craver diagram. I mean, okay, it's got to like be able to causally interact, right? Like we care that stuff bumps into stuff sometimes, mm -hmm. right? But we're not really thinking about the spatial organization of the stuff. And sometimes we write it down and we really, really, really care about like where are the mitochondrial DNA sequences actually getting synthesized and turned into something useful. Um, and I guess that that's a really that's a that's a really cool general question that these kinds of examples I think really make you think about, and I haven't spent, it's like, oh, I've never spent enough time thinking about this question. This is a cool question. Yeah. So I am literally writing a paper right now on spatial <laughs> structure, <laughs> so I'm really excited about that question. Yeah.
most of the time spatial structure matters a lot more than we think. Sure. So there's this guy, Franklin Harold, who thinks that um, this, this is not something that we normally think about because, uh, because of the ways we study uh, cell biochemistry, mm. because most of the ways we study cell biochemistry involve breaking the cell apart and doing just the chemical reactions. But most chemical reactions within cells are directional in space. Mm -hmm. They're not just, mm -hmm. so obviously the cell is not just a bag of molecules, it's a really uh, spatially structured entity. Um, so yeah, I'd say most of the time spatial organization matters. Remind me, there's another cool example that I want to at least but, mention to but, you because it might work I well. have to mention that if the talk of Marcel was right, it's not the spatial relation of things, it's a spatial relation of yeah. process. Yeah. So still that is not clear in my mind which, which view is the best. Can I also come back to that? <laughs> Please do. Um, I think, so I sadly missed uh, Marcel's talk, but... It'll be on YouTube, it's okay. Uh, yeah, that's right, it's really <laughs> excellent. <laughs> but I do think it's the spatial structure of things uh, and not just of processes. And here is an example. So a lot of, I don't know if a lot of, but some organisms are able to survive in a state of cryptobiosis, as in frozen solid, for instance, um, where the only thing that is preserved is the physical structure of the organism, but all processes are stopped. And it is possible, th the fact that it's possible for organisms to survive that, to me, seems to indicate that it is the physical structure, including the spatial structure, that is more important than the processes. And, and the physical structure is what enables those processes to take place. I would be inclined to follow you if I thought that the organism after you defrost it is the same. Oh, it definitely is. I don't know if it's the same. If it's a process vision, it's not the same individual, biological individual, before frozen. Yeah, uh, there's a big literature about this. I did. So some organisms use cryptobiosis as part of their yeah. life cycle, okay. and it, it seems to be... Okay, I... But this is what the yeah. process guy would right, say. Yeah. say. If the process stops, yeah. the I, organism I, dies. I'm just going to say, I, I there's a new one. That sounds like... <laughs> <laughs> no, there are objections to that. Argument. Yeah. yeah, I think it's the same one, so I'm happy to say it's survives. But I, I realize that I'm is a possible trying, reply. Uh, yeah. Pushing your ideas. Other? I can oh, sorry. There's no, that's okay. okay. Which one was first? I, I didn't yeah. see. Well, I took a quick finger on this because I do want to just say I don't think the process ontologists would say something like, "Well, look." Uh, the processes are not just the sort of like biological processes that are happening, right? It's processes all the way down. So it's the material continuity. Uh, what we can, even, let's, let's even assume that it's the same organism. There's still, there is still some kind of process of preservation of the material continuity and that um, at, at, a, at a lower scale or level or whatever you want to say is I think what the process ontologists would, would uh, appeal to. Yeah, the, the membrane is a process. Yeah, it looks right, like. right. Yeah. Sure, I will. You're in shock. I'm sorry. <laughs> you're in shock. No, I'm not. Um, I will add. Um, so the rest of Carl Allen's book, <laughs> which I'm going to really sell, um, is not just that structure is important, but that experimentally structure can be done in the text to test tube by proxy, which is a cool feature of biophysics and biochemistry, mm -hmm. that the actual spatial arrangement of a cell or mitochondria does not have to be studied, but could merely provide the heuristic for experimental work. Now, I don't know how, how this relates to causation at all, but I just thought that that, that is one of the cooler arguments of that book, um, that you can dramatically simplify the actual structure right. and come up with a theory, a theory of the mechanism. Sure, I, I think that's probably true of all kinds of 
research that you can always have a model that is that simplifies a lot of the stuff that you're not particularly interested in but you can also go down to the nitty-gritty details and get like each individual atom models if that's also of interest so um, yeah Thank our speaker.